el, el cosmos sunt scuola normale superiore. Uh, she arrived a few months before the lockdown, so uh, we are looking forward uh, to the end of uh, the restrictions to be able uh, to interact more also offline. But in the meanwhile, we thought it was uh, uh, very uh, important for us to start to uh, discuss and know better her work. Uh, Delal is a, a scholar of Kurdish studies and social movement studies. Uh, she holds a PhD from the State University of New York at Binghamton, the sociology department. Uh, and uh, uh, where she defended uh, a PhD uh, thesis called self craft of the Kurdish youth in the shadow of the Turkish state. Uh, and uh, uh, she's uh, uh, working uh, uh, on uh, uh, issues of uh, making and contesting uh, political subjectivities uh, especially in the process of uh, the Kurdish mobilizations uh, in uh, Turkey. Uh, with uh, uh, PhD, she has won the Distinguished Dissertation Award uh, of uh, uh, State University of New York at, at Binghamton. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I hope to see the work published soon. Uh, and uh, uh, she's here uh, as I mentioned, with uh, the program of the Scholars at Risk, which is uh, sponsored uh, by the, uh, with the position sponsored by the Amici della Scuola Normale in the Tuscan uh, regions, uh, as she's uh, also a scholar who has been very active uh, in uh, uh, promoting peace, uh, in a countries uh, in which uh, these actions uh, have been repressed. Uh, she's uh, going to talk in particular on one topic, uh, which is very important in social movement studies, is the issues of friendship, so uh, networks. And for what I've read of uh, her thesis, uh, her approach resonate very well with the ways in which uh, social movement studies set up address these issues, but it also adds uh, a lot to uh, the more traditional uh, studies. Uh, so she's going to talk of friendship as a political concept, uh, Kurdish youth uh, uh, politics. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Delal, for uh, being with us. Uh, now and for being with us uh, also uh, for this uh, longer period. I give you the floor and uh, those who want uh, to ask questions can use the chat uh, for the moment. Please, Delal, you have the floor. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Donatella, for your nice words and this nice introduction. But I uh, also like for a moment, I would like to turn my uh, gratitude to people in SNS, or people you, Lorenzo, Elisabetta, Valentina, everyone, uh, and also uh, Sar Italy uh, for supporting my studies. Uh, so I I am going to talk about friendship, but let me open this uh, my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, uh, I am going to talk about friendship as a political concept. Uh, this talk is based on a part of my dissertation, which was submitted to a sociology department, but I believe that my discussion on friendship may speak to progressive people in different areas of social sciences, as Donatello also told, especially social movement studies and uh, studies on Turkey and many uh, other fields. Uh, in my dissertation, I explored the building of Kurdish youth movement in the 1990s. And I wanted to look at the 1990s because it was a period of two interrelated developments. First, the Kurdish mobilization led by the PKK, Kurdistan Workers' Party, reached at its peak in the 1990s. And second, as a response to this vast mobilization, 
extreme state violence over the Kurds marked the, this period as a time of horror and trauma. And the 1990s was a period of turmoil, but the actors, events, concepts, and meanings emerged in this period shaped the following decades of politics in Turkey. In my research, I approached this period as a sociological convergence point to observe a revolutionary mobilization under the conditions of extreme state violence. Before focusing on friendship relations among the Kurdish youth in this period, I would like to underline some figures to point out the extent of PKK organization in this state violence in this period. This will be important for me to, while discussing some of my arguments on the political importance of friendship relations. So this period, it is uh, the rise of PKK basically, is uh, starting from the very beginning of the decade. Guerrilla forces reached about 15,000 to 20,000 uh, all over Kurdish region. There were mass demonstrations. And also Kurdish political demands were represented in Turkish parliament starting from People's Labour Party. Uh, and uh, against this mobilization, the state, Turkish state, applied low in intensity warfare policies. This was the, a total war on both armed and unarmed sections of the Kurdish movement. So uh, in the line of these policies, a regime of state of emergency was expanded to all Kurdistan region, and a regional government, state of emergency regional government was formed. And this government was equipped with extremely broad power and legally protected with a total impunity. And the military was restructured and the village guard system was stated among the Kurdish society. And in addition to this, there was this phenomenon of the deep state. This term was originated in Turkey during this period. So it had basically three uh, arms. One was this illegal military organization inside the military, we called Jutan, and contract killers together with uh, former PKK militants who became repentants and Kurdish Hezbollah. It, was, uh, it had nothing to do with Le Hezbollah in Lebanon. It was a highly secretive organization founded in Turkish Kurdistan. And they were basically in conflict with the PKK and they killed hundreds of PKK members and sympathizers. So as a result of this, uh, uh, policies, uh, uh, you can see the numbers, like thousands of people were killed and they were subject to enforced disappearance and political killings and people lost their, people were displaced, they, they lost their houses, they were evacuated, the villages were evacuated and burnt, and there was also mass graves and acid waste even. They were rebuilt mostly in 2011, and bones were found in the mass graves. Uh, so basically, uh, the result of this low intensity warfare was the destruction of Kurdish communities. But uh, it was also the time of uh, national liber liberation struggle for the Kurds, and it was the time of their the actors of this struggle. So, the, uh, so uh, my work was on this resistance aspect of this, uh, this decade, and I conducted a field research in this Kurdish city, the Abakur. It is the most populated Kurdish city in Turkey and the political and symbolic center of the Kurdish movement, but also the, the center of Turkish state's counter insurgency warfare. And in this, uh, uh, city, I I looked at a specific high school, uh, the Agukar High School. It's called. It is one of the oldest high schools in uh, Ottoman Empire time, and it was the only high school for decades. 
And in this size culture, the youths were basically invited to be the civilization, like in many colonial contexts, and to be part of the civilization. So this photo at Outlet, this, uh, this is from 1933. Uh, you know, this modern woman uh, studying at school. And this high school was named after Ria Gökert, uh, the photo on the right. Uh, he was the founder of Turkism and he, he taught sociology classes in the high school. But he was ironically an ethnic Kurd and from a student of Diyarbakir. Uh, so in the high school, with its legacy and together with this curriculum and everything, uh, the Kurdish kids were invited to be, Turk, be Turkish. And it was a sincere invitation because it really worked for more than a century. Many statesmen, academics, and artists graduated from the high school, became a part of larger Turkish society, and they became ministers and everything. But in the 1990s, this school became the hotbed of PKK student mobilization. Uh, so I, uh, I approached this high school as a microcosm to observe the vast political and sociological change in Kurdish society in this period. I interviewed the former students of the school to understand the processes that made them receptive to the PKK school for struggle. And I mainly focused on the, those who were actively involved in the PKK student mobilization. At the time when uh, I interviewed them, they were in their late 30s. So after more than 20 years, I asked them about their experience of dedicating a life for the revolutionary ideas. And I was aware that their accounts were about their present as much as their past. In this ethnography, uh, friendship emerged as an unexpected political concept, actually. Before conducting my field research, I was aware of the strength of friendship relations between the PKK youth, but uh, there was something more. They, my respondents told me about how friendship was formative in their uh, mobilization. Uh, friendship served as a political ground in the school to form a collective identity and a sense of belonging among the students. And it was also formative in their mobilization by being a space for crafting a revolutionary self, practicing a sense of mutual recognition, and producing worldly forms of community building. Now I will go over these points. Uh, to suggest treating friendship as a political concept. My first suggestion is friendship as a space for recognition. Here, by recognition, I refer to acknowledgement of one's being in the world as a valuable being, valuable life. My ethnographic analysis shows that the exclusion, exclusion of Kurdishness from the state space has been constitutive in the formation of Kurdish youth politics. My respondents told me about various forms of physical violence that they faced during, uh, in their, in, 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 during their school years. And mostly they told about the police presence in the school and school administration, like principal and vice principals, using their offices like police stations. And Kurdish Hezbollah groups attacking them at the school exits, and etc. As much as, this, as physical violence, they also told me about the symbolic violence of Kurdishness, uh, Turkishness, sorry. This was the exclusion and marginalization of Kurdish language and Kurdish ways of doing things. This lack of recognition was similar to other experiences of the excluded and mar the marginalized. To express my solidarity 
with our comrades in the United States of America, I want to quote Junif now, who was the co-founder of the Black Panther Party. And this quote is from his autobiographic book, uh, Revolutionary Suicide. I quote, during those long years in Oakland public schools, I didn't have one teacher who taught me about anything relevant to my own life experience. Not one instructor ever evoked me in, a, me, a, in me a desire to learn more or to question or to explore the worlds of literature, science, and history. All they did was try to rob me of the sense of my own uniqueness and worth. And in the process, nearly killed my urge to inquire. Uh, I suggest that friendship is a ground to heal, heal the wounds of this lack of recognition. Due to its in-between position between the public and the private, friendship provides a special space for a sense of mutual recognition. Friends are close to each other, close to the self, enough to understand, appreciate, and love each other. But they are not the extended self. They are still public. Friends are the public other to each other, but different than the public represented by the state. They are not hostile to the self. My another point is about the intimacy and friendship relation. And by intimacy, I especially uh, mean joy, love, and play. Uh, to, for that, I would like to tell you about the story of my respondent, Sinan, uh, that he told me in my interview with him. Uh, Sinan and his friends, organize, they were organizing many protests to uh, explicitly show that PKK was in the school. So in one, but one of these protests uh, were ended very radical way than they initially planned. Uh, this is the story of it. Uh, Ismail uh, asked Sinan some money to buy dye and brush to cover the walls of the school. And uh, uh, Sinan gave the money. He was the responsible person for the money issues in the group. And uh, then the next day, uh, they saw that, okay, the walls were covered with PKK slogans, but also the, the, the bust of Ataturk was also red. And, and the, the red dye was all on Ataturk bust. And uh, Sinan was surprised as much as others. And here are his words about this incident. Uh, I am quoting Sinan. Ataturk was bright red. I said, what is this? Ismail said, I poured the leftover paint on his head. Then he gave me the rest of the money. I asked him, why did you paint Ataturk? He said, what was I supposed to do with the leftover paint? Take it home? I said, you didn't do good to Ataturk. He said, why? I said, look at them. Nobody is looking at the walls, but Ataturk. And this form of, any form of attack on the Ataturk bust, uh, which is, which stood uh, in front of every school entrance in Turkey, was an unthinkable act at, in the 1990s. But they, it happened and they saw it there. But it wasn't a planned act of a counter ideology or it was not targeted to the premises of the Turkish Republic. It was like when Sinan told me about this story, he was laughing all the time. And, uh, and he remembers this as a joyful trouble created by a humorous friend. For sure, uh, doing something unthinkable requires courage as much as humor. And as a matter of fact, Ismail would eventually lose his life as a high-ranking guerrilla. But Sinan didn't love Ismail because he was a hero to him. For we may respect heroic acts of people, but this doesn't 
make them our friends. Today, Sinan remembers Ismail as a friend, and he mourns after his friend that he loved and he lost. Sinan and Ismail were bound to each other by innumerable moments, where they together experienced joy and worry, fear and courage, excitement and horror and trust and disappointment. These were the moments upon which their friendship was built. These were also the very moments that their political subjectivities were formed. My point is that the friendship between Sinan and Ismail was more political than the calls both the state and the PKK directed to them. Together as playful young friends, they experienced the possibility of making things differently. I think that this is the core of being a political subject and it is more political than supporting a certain political idea. And my next point will be relationship between friendship and community building. Uh, with this, I am basically talking about uh, these students in 1990s. They looked after each other under the conditions of extreme violence, such as when the Hezbollah members attacked them at the school exit or when under police custody and so on. They couldn't protect each other from that. Actually, the, the Kurds called this generation of uh, 1990s as the lost generation because of the actual loss of lives among them. But they stood for each other and became a bread for each other uh, when they were sur surrounded by that. And this made them a community. The power of today's Kurdish movement lies in everyday practices of community building. And for sure, friendship relations was one of the spaces for this strong community building. Uh, to conclude, I would like to summarize my points about friendship as a political concept by comparing the experience of friendship with the idea of friendship in the philosophical canon. So these arguments about philosophical canon are based mainly on Derrida's the politics of friendship. In the philosophical canon, uh, true friendship is a telos, it's a path to go, even one never attains to it. So it is famously expressed by uh, saying, oh, my friends, there is no friend, which is attributed to Aristotle. Uh, and another specificity about it is that its friendship is considered as a concern of two people and a bond between brothers. It's an alliance of brothers. And this bond is away from wrecked relations of everyday life. So it's a sacred bond between brothers. Uh, the experience of friendship, on the other hand, it is a movement between the self and others, and also between the public and private, we may add. And it contains the communities and based on the mundane relations of the everyday life. And it is a daily practice of imagining other possibilities. And it is a space for an everyday production of life, especially under the conditions of extreme violence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's an interesting presentation. And uh, uh, I. I don't see at the moment anyone who wants to take the floor. I, I can uh, exploit the privilege of the chair uh, by uh, raising a few points. That's uh, uh, your brilliant presentation is uh, stimulated. In um, uh, about the role of friendship in high risk forms of activism. Uh, I think your results resonate very well uh, with the uh, results that, for instance, Doug McAdam had on the Freedom Summer, uh, in my work and in Lorenzo Bossi's work, also on 
high risk forms of activism. And I, I was, and of course, these uh, uh, friendship ties you add are important uh, uh, in uh, addressing uh, the quest for recognitions. Uh, space for recognitions reminded me also of the work of Alessandro Pizzorno when he presented the creation of uh, political uh, progressive movements uh, as related with uh, this um, um, uh, areas in which people uh, could be familiar with each other. Ci si può dare del tu was the term that he used. You are on. And, and I think this is extremely important. I was thinking also in terms of, of uh, uh, the uh, different types of uh, friendship ties uh, in different contexts, especially in terms of uh, how kulu cumulative they are with other types of ties, for instance, with family ties. Because what I saw in my uh, uh, political uh, group, radical group on the left, uh, was that this changed for different generations. So for some generations, friendship was strengthening well, the, the family type of socialization for other generations, it was an alternative. So the group was uh, a family. They used a lot this term. It is my family, it is like a family, but it was uh, 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 a type of militancy that implied cutting ties with the real or original uh, family uh, and uh, building um, another one and uh, uh, and so this i think could have also different type of effect on something that in my research emerged as uh, a potential shortcoming of the friendship so the fact that strong bonds um, tend to uh, close the groups towards the outside uh, or at least um, per the outside start to perceive the group as uh, uh, too close for them. I'm thinking also about the work of uh, feminist scholars, uh, Joe Freeman and others of the uh, um, sorry, paradoxical effect of these very strong ties uh, uh, in political uh, uh, environment. And so I was wondering if then following the stories, uh, uh, some of this um, potential uh, risk uh, uh, emerge uh, as well. Uh, um, but very interesting. I, uh, now I have also a question which I just saw. Uh, from Larissa, do you want to collect a couple of questions, Delal? Uh, Delal, your mic is off. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can uh, I can talk about your points and then we can continue. Okay. Or, yes. Or please. It more. please. Uh, actually, uh, uh, this uh, the friend the relationship between friend family, but also in my case because they were high school, you know, at high school at time, you know, teenagers, you know, they, they, it was also love, love affairs appeared a lot, you know, this, especially platonic love, those things. So actually, uh, it was died all the time, like these close ties, like, uh, how is it different uh, from family or love? These, these are open. I, I really don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to, uh, I actually, I don't want to say this is friendship and this is family. I, I don't, because I don't know enough about it. Um, and also maybe, and I, uh, also in my interviews, this point appeared uh, all the time that this uh, friendship relation becomes love relation, love relationship becomes friendship, you know. Uh, and I don't want to, uh, make categorization because for them 
they were, they lived under emergency conditions. Uh, and actually, at one point, nothing uh, mattered because they, it was one of the things they were all the time saying. When they in the early morning, when they left their home, they would say uh, they didn't know if they would come back in the evening. So within these emergency conditions, uh, things were uh, very like inside each other, and maybe it is. One of the, I mean, it's sad, of course, but one of the beauties of revolutionary times that they were very open to many new experiences. So that's also another reason that I don't want to divide between where friendship starts and where it ends. So I actually don't know, and I don't know how to do it uh, with, by being uh, fair to them. I, I don't want to be unfair, uh, and I don't know how to be fair about it. Donatella, you... Uh, Mike. Sorry. <laughs> uh, what, I, what I meant was not so much uh, uh, the, the difference of intensity of uh, the type of affective ties, but more the fact that what I saw was that in some uh, cases, these uh, friendship ties were also embedded within family ties. Yes. Uh, in other cases, it was an alternative. Mm. Uh, and uh, then that's uh, sometimes, since the ties were so strong, uh, they tended to exclude others. And I was wondering if uh, uh, this was also the case. Exactly, this was the case. Uh, there were also co cousins, also friends. At some points, they were exactly the same. Sometimes embedded, but sometimes they talked about their friendship relations as alternative to their family ties. But sometimes they were, for example, pr uh, proud of how their friends were also like a family member visiting their parents, you know. But well, it was the same. I, I think it was the same. Uh, and also about this uh, shortcoming of friendship as being strong and close ties. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, yes, it, it 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 was a risk, and it. I mean, it was a, a close community. But uh, but in some other points, uh, PKK. Uh, doesn't uh, use the term comrade, but they use this Kurdish word, which means friend. So a uh, friend in Heval, I mean, in, in Kurdish, it means both comrade and friend. So maybe in time, uh, it is emb em embraced as a political thing. Uh, I am not saying that it's based on this experience, but it is maybe uh, in relation to this, you know, larger processes. Uh, so I I heard uh, some, you know, uh, accounts that talking, uh, for example, in prisons, if two prisoners, PKK prisoners, are too close to each other, the PKK people would warn them because it was too uh, close ties and it is uh, be, uh, against comradeship. So there is always this tension between comradeship and friendship, too. Uh, so, yes, uh, both are two. Yeah, the same. Yes. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Delal. Uh, Larissa? Uh, yeah. Hey, Larissa. Larissa. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. It was uh, very interesting to listen to. And uh, yeah, I also have like coming from my own research and also friendship type. I also kind of experienced that uh, very important. And uh, all what you said, I kind of I have it too. But I was wondering, um, in my case, some of my interviews would also say that it would put a lot of pressure on them because also the LT3 the group they kind of framed the youth as those who are responsible to 
win the war. It was like the point was always like families, fathers, mothers, they have to take care of the kids, they have more time, blah, blah, blah. So the youth, they have to do something. And uh, I have also had interviews for me, they spent a lot of time just kind of running away from the armed group and trying to kind of also exclude themselves from these very bad friendships which they considered as yeah, forcing them to do something they did not want to do. They wanted to study, they wanted to do something else, but all these different ways, you know, not participating in the conflict, not contributing, were kind of devalued and considered as selfish, as something that is kind of not conducive to the fight and that's yeah, somehow, yeah, selfish and egoistic. And I just wanted to ask whether this type of peer pressure was also uh, an issue in your interviews and your work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank, Thank you, Larissa. And the last, do you want to add? Yes, yeah. yes uh, it was a very similar experience again, I think. So if they had, uh, so youth are the basic war force, right? Like mm -hmm. they are the, uh, I mean, while giving the numbers, I told more than 20,000 people died as PKK militants. And they were mostly, of course, young people. And uh, there was always this, when, uh, I mean, I didn't have time today to talk about it, but very important part of this story is that many, many young people died, really. They, their friends died, like, uh, I mean, I told you about Sinan, but Ismailis died. So Sinan feels guilty about it. So because he couldn't continue the path, uh, Ismail ended in the right place, maybe. But, uh, so they had this feeling that they, they, they couldn't finish the path that they took together with their friends. And they, they, they didn't conclude the, the, their responsibilities. Uh, so it is, uh, so they were the main people, as you also observed in your case. Uh, and yes, yes, it is the thing, the same, I think. Many things are very similar. We talked uh, earlier, right, Larissa? Yeah, it is. Maybe in the Yeah, no, no, it's true. Yes, yes. yes. Very sad. Thank you. Uh, Alberto Tonini? Uh, yes. A colleague from the Scholar at Risk at University of yes. uh, Florence. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Della Porta. Let me say hello to Delal. Oh, hello. Um, we met uh, once early in March, immediately before yes. the lockdown. Uh, we have been forced to live for the following two months. Um, yes, I have a couple of points uh, I would like to share with you, Delal. Uh, you spoke mainly about uh, uh, students uh, living in uh, Kurd uh, Kurdish, uh, Turkish region. Uh, but my question is, what about uh, the Kurdish uh, uh, pupils and the students living in the largest uh, Turkish uh, cities, uh, such as Istanbul, uh, Ankara, or Izmir, uh, did they have the same schooling uh, experience? Uh, did they have uh, a similar friendship network? Uh, or do you see some differences in these terms with the uh, students and the people living uh, in uh, Kurdistan, in Turkish Kurdistan? Uh, what difference in terms of political activism or in terms of mobilization? for the uh, Kurdish students living in the urban environments. Thanks. Thank you, Alberto. Actually, I am one of the students who lived in Turkish city. I lived in Izmir when I was in high school. Uh, so I actually, it is one of the, you know, the things that uh, it covered all my uh 
research uh, because I am and I always comparing, you know, in my mind, you know, what was it similar or different? Of course, there are differences, but maybe there is such a thing, uh, thing that the spirit of time or something like that. Because my experience was at some very important points, very similar. And uh, during my interviews, even at sometimes my uh, respondents were saying, how do you know this? I mean, I knew it from my experience too. So we had, uh, of course, we were very few in as Kurdish students, uh, but we ha also had strong ties, friendship ties. Uh, uh, and we were like, of course, uh, this uh, recognition, especially part, was maybe more important because we really, we were really alone in other pairs, including our families, maybe sometimes because uh, in West Kurds in Western Turkey, sometimes even families don't speak in Kurdish. So. Uh, supporting uh, an idea of Kurdishness and also which was a, also a revolution and so socialist understanding at the time of early 1990s when the, everybody was talking about breaking the walls, you know, Berlin the wall, <laughs> you know, this collapse of Soviet Union, etc. We were like some weird, you know, uh, Kids, uh, so the, this mutual recognition uh, was maybe even more important comparing to Kurdistan at the time, but the things were similar, I think. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. And are there other? Uh, questions from the floor? Yes. Yes, hello. Rosa. Yes, I have a question. Ciao, Rosa. Uh, Rosa. Um, so, because I also conducted some interviews, I, I just um, thought about what you said about the recognition space, because um, I think in the 90s, um, well, in light of the denial of you know Kurdish identity, it was very important for um, Kurdish people or let's say Kurdish students to find these kind of ties and create a space of friendship. But I also recognized in my interviews that I conducted with women <laughs> that there was also the gender aspect. So many women who had those close um, let's say, revolutionary friendship ties, they also expressed very strongly that for the first time in high school, in the PKK mobilization, they were actually recognized as women participating in, you know, political friendships. And um, I think this is very interesting. And I think this is also something that characterizes the Kurdish political movement in general until today, that there is always this um, creation of space for uh, recognition, but not necessarily only um, within the binary of Turkish and Kurdish, but also within all those other marginalized identities that can come with. I mean, it could be um, a religious identity in addition to your Kurdish identity, Alevis, for instance, or it could be your gender role or your gender identity. So I, I wonder, did you already, because you interviewed um, yeah, those people, if that was also mentioned um, to you in your interviews, because I, I found it very, um, yeah, it kind of comes up a lot, the whole gender, gender issue as a space. I mean, the Kurdish political mobilization in the 90s, especially in the high schools and universities, as a space of recognition, but not only Kurdish recognition of identity, but also in terms of gender, um, yeah, gender um, recognition. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It was lovely. <laughs> Thank you, Rosa. Uh, yes, uh, I uh, I am grateful for this question. Uh, it is it is uh, this time the early 1990s were also the time of 
the Kurdish women appear to be political actors. Uh, so it was similar in the school. Uh, they 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 really uh, enjoyed uh, being uh, like being recognized in in the meaning that uh, like as valuable lives uh, as women as like uh, valuable lives. It, it was also uh, true for class relations. Like some of maybe more than half of them. I mean, this school was very upper class school, but at that time, during early 1990s, uh, also lower class uh, students were accepted. So there was also this huge issue of class differences in the school at the time that I interviewed. And also Alevis versus Sunni. Uh, so what is very uh, striking to me uh, that which appeared in the, this ethnography that they really, these students came together as friends at the side of the lowest, you know, like they were women, they were lower class, they were Kurdish, and they, there were Turk, ethnic Turks among them, but they were like Kurds, they were just doing the same things. And also as women, they, they, they were, I mean, I can't say that it was totally, oh, this, this was a dream creation, but it was, it was the thing actually. Like they, they, they united at the point where the, the state uh, that as they experienced in the school, but the state also as they experienced in the streets of the city as violence, where the state, uh, the, the denial of uh, the state, like these marginalized, marginalized identities really came together. But it was not like in the way that, oh, I am a woman, I am with you, or I am a Turk, but I am with Kurds. It was basically they, the a Turk would feel like a Kurd and a woman, uh, a man would feel like woman. I mean, they appeared as political actors together. So that's why I think that friendship uh, relations, this mutual recognition uh, in friendship relations, I, I, I find it very, very liberatory because it is a movement. It is not a fixed state of being, like I am this and I am mm, with you. But it is a movement all the time. There is always uh, a movement between different identities who are excluded, but also feelings also imaginations. They together imagined a new world where the, it wouldn't matter being a Turk or Kurd, wouldn't matter many other differences. Yeah. Thank you. I think it is interesting also in a comparative perspective because uh, when I studied the uh, ETA in the Basque countries, especially in the beginning, there were strong friendship, but it was related to the quadrillas, which was uh, the uh, group of um, uh, uh, men that were boys and men then that were friends together. So it was uh, uh, quite homogeneous while uh, mm -hmm. uh, you talk of the plurality of groups. I have Marco De Seris who wants to ask a question as well. Marco, please. Oh, hi, Bella. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi. Yes. Uh, thank you for, for this talk. You gave me a lot of food for thought. Um, I was, um, I thought that you were using the term uh, subjectivity instead of uh, identity to remark um, the openness of the Kurdish uh, movement to different types of um, intersections, we would say today, right? Um, so it's not a matter so much of getting uh, recognized as, as you say, as a young person or as a woman or as, but uh, finding also uh, open identities, that is subjectivities in this struggle. And 
as I was uh, listening to this, I was thinking about the relationship uh, between uh, friendship as an elective bond um, that at least uh, in the in the West after the 60s, uh, friendship became this kind of elective relationship uh, in a way that you could get out of your family as well, right? The typical commune of the 60s is this moment in which you actually break ties with your family. But at the same time, you were saying that there were, this was also overlapping with uh, family relationships so that friendship was not a way of developing an elective relationship apart and possibly even against families, but uh, something that was still integrated with it. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering whether you deepen this aspect of the relationship between a relationship that you choose and another condition of necessity that is also dictated by the context in which you're operating, which is a context of war. So um, what is this kind of relationship? Because when, when we look at classical, like sociological work of Doug Adam on the civil rights movement, for example, he talks about strong ties, immobilization, and by strong ties, he means both family relationships and friendship and he puts them side by side. It doesn't draw a line. It seems that this is similar to what you're doing. Uh, but at the same time, when we think about, uh, as I said, after the 60s about friendship, it's not so much dictated by necessity, but by choice. So I was wondering whether you uh, went further into, into this kind of uh, analysis or not. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this question. Actually, it is... Uh... Uh, it's, it is very important, uh, it was an important aspect of especially my uh, respondents' accounts because they uh, valued friendship, uh, in their words, they, they said voluntary relationship, like, uh, because family, because we are talking about this traditional Kurdish family, you know, strong ties, very, like, uh, a lot of obligations, etc. While family is a, you know, necessity, as you said, they refer friendship as a voluntary tie. Uh, especially in one interview, it was very uh, like interesting. So there was this incident that this uh, Hezbollah attacks this Kurdish guy. He is hospitalized, uh, and in the hospital, uh, this guy's aunt. Uh, and friends are together. The aunt is a Kurdish politician. She she says uh, she yells at them and says that he, uh, why didn't you protect your friend? And uh, so so my uh, respondent was very much uh, you know still angry with this you know uh, after twenty years he was very like. I mean, it was he. He was experiencing it as if it was a new thing while telling me, and he said that his tie, uh, her tie with my friend was necessity, but my tie was voluntary, and she she only visited those uh, because she was there because uh, this friend was his uh, nephew, but for uh, we were there for every friend, so for him. Family is exclusionary because when your family member is in hospital, you go. But for uh, for friendship, I friendship was more inclusive because for every friend, they were there. And also, voluntary tie was more important, more valuable to him uh, in uh, in her in his account. Uh, yes. Uh, Yes, these different intersections, uh, like sometimes, but uh, as I, uh, as Donatella's comment, uh, it, sometimes they were supporting each other, but sometimes, uh, but also th it was not like necessarily this point or that point. If within the same interview, you could hear uh, contradictory comments about 
appreciate. Uh, I think they were working, operating together as contradictory uh, relationships. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all. I uh, give a look at the chat, but I don't see anyone, just people thanking you, uh, Delal. So uh, I think it has been a very interesting discussion and uh, uh, this was just uh, the first of your Cosmos talks and you have been yeah. with us also in other occasions. So uh, as soon as possible, we will have also another talk by Delal on other parts of uh, uh, work and uh, we hope this time uh, um, offline. Uh, and uh, well, I also wish to thank uh, the audience, uh, those who have expressed comments in writing, uh, and all of you for a very interesting afternoon. Delal, thanks again. Thank you. you. Thank you, Donatella. Ciao. Thank you, everyone.